morning. I'm Alice Finnamore. I'm the minister at Prince William Pastoral Church in New Brunswick, Canada. Thank you for joining us. Gather us in, ground us in you. Gather us in, ground us in you. Gather us in, gather us in, ground us, ground us in you. Let's pray. Founder of the universe, holy mystery, spirit of all that is unknown to us, join us this day as we gather from many sanctuaries, we breathe deeply, we close our eyes. We gather our hearts together, one love, one body, one people, the spirit of the wind brushing us against one another, the remnants of a remembered hug, handshake, elbow tap, face-to-face -face smile, warming us, reminding us of the intimacy we share in your name. Holy One of us all, we worship thus. Amen. Thanks to the Reverend Leslie Hamilton for this opening prayer. Our scripture today is taken from uh, the second chapter of Acts, the first 21 verses. On the day of Pentecost, all of the Lord's followers were together in one place. Suddenly there was a noise from heaven like a sound of a mighty wind. It filled the house where they were meeting. Then they saw it looked like fiery tongues moving in all directions, and a tongue came and settled on each person there. The Holy Spirit took control of everyone, and they began speaking whatever languages the Spirit let them speak. Many religious Jews from every country in the world were living in Jerusalem, and when they heard this noise, a crowd gathered. But they were surprised because they were hearing everything in their own languages. They were excited and amazed and said, Don't all those who are speaking come from Galilee? Then why do we hear them speaking our very own languages? Some of us are from Parthia, Media, and Elam. Others are from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, Rome, Crete, and Arabia. Some of us were born Jews and others have chosen to be Jews. Yet we all hear them using our own languages to tell the wonderful things that God has done. Everyone was excited and confused. Some of them even kept asking each other, what does all this mean? Others made fun of the Lord's followers and said, they are drunk. Peter stood with the 11 apostles and spoke in a loud and clear voice to the crowd. Friends and everyone else living in Jerusalem, listen carefully to what I have to say. You are wrong to think that these people are drunk. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what God had the prophet Joel say. When the last days come, I will give my spirit to everyone. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will have dreams. In those days, I will give my spirit to my servants, both men and women, and they will prophesy. I will work miracles in the sky above and wonders on the earth below. There will be blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will turn dark and the moon will be as red as blood before the great and wonderful day of the Lord appears. Then the Lord will save everyone who asks for his help. May our spirits be blessed by these words from our ancient scriptures. I'm going to start by saying happy birthday. Today is the birthday of the church. Church with a capital C. It's Pentecost, the day when the Spirit filled the disciples. 
Pentecost, the day that the followers of Jesus went from a handful of scared and sad friends to a crowd of 3,000 who began to change the world. Originally, though, Pentecost was a celebration of the giving of the Ten Commandments. That happened on the 50th day after the people of Israel had left Egypt. The Ten Commandments are a set of ethical laws that apply to everyone if we want to shape a just society. Put spiritual things first in your life. Take time to rest. Respect your elders. Don't murder, steal, lie, or gossip. Don't commit adultery or desire what is not yours. This set of ethical laws is worth celebrating. Perhaps if we still celebrated them, we would have a better world. But the people of the time thought that they needed more detail. What exactly did it mean to put spiritual things first or to rest on the Sabbath? And so an extended set of laws was developed. We do the same today with our laws. Right now, being kind to our neighbor means wearing a mask when we're out, shopping by yourself to get things done rather than shopping for entertainment and following arrows on the floor etc. But Jesus said they only needed one law, one law that summed up all the rest, the law of love. To love everyone, to be kind to everyone, to live the golden rule. That's what the Ten Commandments and all the details and explanations boil down to a law of love. Love one another as I have loved you, Jesus said on the night before he died. Jesus died because he was advocating for non-violent resistance to the established system, a system that made the rich rich and the poor even more poor. Love your neighbor as yourself is a radical way of living when most of the world is focused on getting more stuff for ourselves rather than for our neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself is radical and outrageous when it means being willing to die, to give up your own personal rights for someone else even if it means your own death. So into this ancient world with its laws that said how to love, but were no longer enacted in a loving way, the spirit arrived in glorious and unexpected surprise. It was the day when the people of God stopped being defined as just the children of Abraham. It was the day that God's love and covenant was opened up to the whole world. In his sermon that day, Peter quoted the prophet Joel. Joel had said that there would be a day when God would pour out the Spirit on all people. And that day turned out to be the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Easter. One commentary said that one of the most important things that a Pentecost sermon can do is point out how God breathes ways, breathes life into God's people. And so I wonder how is God breathing life into our church today? Breathing life into a person usually means that they're dead or dying. Breathing life into a person means 
bringing them back, getting them enough oxygen to maintain life, doing CPR or putting them on a ventilator. The church today is dying. Perhaps I should phrase that. The church of yesterday is dying. The church of Christendom is dying. The church that everyone was a part of just by being born no longer exists. No longer exists. If we think it does, then we are deluding ourselves. But the church of today has not dying. New life is being breathed into it even now, today. The Spirit is at work in our presence today, even though we're not meeting face to face. I'd like to say that the Spirit is massively at work today because we're not able to meet face to face. When the Spirit moves, things change. But we hate things to change. We feel much safer doing the same thing that we've always done. But this virus has given us something that's more frightening than the idea of doing church differently. More frightening than having to be church differently. Change is always challenging always difficult. We drag our feet until something happens that forces us to make the change and the changes that we resist. For example, if we are being encouraged to simplify our lives or to declutter our homes, how often do we suppose that most of what we have are essential or have sentimental value like the worn the worn out t-shirts that some people have and can't let go but if there was a fire if your house was on fire all of a sudden we know what is important if we think we're preparing for um, an evacuation we're not likely to save the old t-shirts we are doing church differently today, online like this, in churches all around the world. Because the spirit, aka the virus, has made this new way of doing church easier and safer than being together face to face. We choose what's most important about our church life and hold on to that for dear life, whether it's online services or Zoom conversations. In Jesus' time, the people thought they knew what was important. They thought that they knew what God wanted of them. In Jesus' time, the people heard his message of love, but they resisted that change, especially if it meant giving up their life. They resisted that one law, the law of love. They wanted to receive love, of course, but they resisted the challenge of being love, the challenge to pour out their lives in love for the life of others. Then something happened. Something happened that opened up the way to something new. On that morning, that Pentecost morning, God breathed new life into God's people. Everything changed that day. And when God changes things, even the difficult things, the difficult changes are good. Earlier this year, at Prince William Pastoral Charge, we started a book study on the book that's called Fishing Tips. It's a book on change and risk written by John Pentland, the minister of Hillhurst United Church in Calgary. We weren't very far into our study before the virus hit. Our first meetings, though, had us excited about the possibilities, the ideas that we were having, the ideas of trying new things. 
we had not yet reached the point of putting those new things into practice with all the scariness of the change that it would involve. When John Pentland started working at Hillhurst United, there were very few people in the congreg congregation. There were so few that they expected him to be their last minister. They expected that they would soon close. John Pentland asked the congregation if they would let him lead, and they did. With his leadership, they agreed to try different things. And today, instead of closing, they have two services on a Sunday that are full and engaged in ministry. They never would have guessed that there would be a book written about their success. They never would have guessed that I would be sitting here today sharing a story about them as an example of how the Spirit breathes new life into the church with a capital C. Pentland says that one of the biggest problems that the church has is a lack of connection to our culture. We're very good at being nice, but we're not connected to what matters to the people who don't usually come to church on a Sunday morning. Jesus, by contrast, was out in the streets, hanging out in the coffee shops, so to speak, telling stories that made sense to the people in their current situations, whatever those situations might be. That's what the disciples were doing that morning, that first Pentecost morning. It started in private, inside a house. But the way it happened drew a crowd. Seeing the crowd, the disciples went outside where the people were, just like Jesus did. Do we do that? For a long, long time, we expected the people to come in where we were, and the people did. On Sunday mornings, there were cars in the parking lots. Almost all the cars were in the church parking lots. Few cars were in their driveways on Sunday morning. If your car was in your driveway on Sunday morning, that would probably be frowned upon just as much as if you had done your laundry on Sunday. Sunday was for church. That's not true any longer. These days, Sunday might be the only day that we would find cars in people's driveways. Our lives so often take us, take us out of our homes, out to work, to school, to events. Our busy lives leave little time for church on Sunday morning. Now, I know that for those of you who do go to church on Sunday morning, that you enjoy the companionship, the community, the love that you find at church. Or you value an hour of peace in the midst of a chaotic world. But that has not been enough to keep our churches full. Not any longer. So how is the Spirit breathing life into the church today? On this Pentecost in 2020, I heard John Pentland speak three years ago at our conference meeting. He told us a story about going sailing with, an Olymp with the Olympic sailing team. He was excited to learn from them, but the wind did not blow. How were they going to sail? No problem, they told him. When there is no wind, everyone on the boat looks for ripples on the water. Look for the ripples where the wind has stirred the water and go where the wind is already blowing. We need to pay attention to what God is doing in the world. We need to watch where the Spirit is moving and follow that. That day of Pentecost, people were milling around on the streets in a holiday atmosphere. That's when the wind of the Spirit began to blow. It sounded like a gale, but no one could tell where it was coming from. The wind, the spirit, spread like wildfire. 
everyone came running. What they heard made them think that the disciples must be drunk. So Peter told the crowds that it was not the spirit of alcohol that was freely flowing that morning. It was the spirit of God as promised by Joel. The prophet Joel had written that God would pour out the spirit. All people, young and old, male and female, would prophesy, dream dreams, and have visions. Peter talked for a long time. He said way more than what we read in the passage that we had this morning. In the end, 3,000 people came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah and the church was born. Today, the world is in chaos, but chaos is what has to happen for something new to be born. Out of Jesus' death, something new came. The spirit came, life came, resurrection came. We need to trust that there is resurrection for our own chaos. Can we trust? Can we trust what God is doing today? In February, would we have been willing to step into online, online ministry? We knew it was important, but it just seemed to be too complicated, too expensive, too difficult. And then the wind of the Spirit began to blow, and the flame of the Spirit burned away our traditions. Suddenly, churches around the world were going online, doing things differently. Suddenly, we were out of our buildings and into the world. Suddenly, people who do not usually come to church are hearing the message and are responding all around the world. The Spirit is active today. The wind is blowing. God is with us, taking us in a different direction than we ever would have expected. Can we trust the wind of spirit to take us where we need to go? We're changing into something that we are not going to recognize, but God is with us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Come, O Spirit, 
Dwell among us, give us words of fire and flame. Help our feeble lips to praise you. Let's pray. Holy One, Creator, everything, everywhere is your creation, both the beautiful and appreciated and the more difficult and annoying, like viruses and black flies. The earth, the air, the rivers and oceans are full of your creatures. All of nature depends on you for sustenance and you feed them. You see new life around us everywhere, in fiddleheads and dandelions, in bumblebees and butterflies. Our scriptures say that it is all good, that it gives the creator pleasure. The birds wake before dawn to sing praise. We join them in wonder at the beauty of the earth, at the gifts that come to us, unasked and undeserved, simply out of love, May our gratitude be as abundant as our blessings. Today, we pray also for those around the world who are not as fortunate, for those who are sick with this virus, for those who are feeling vulnerable and afraid. May they know the presence of the Holy with them and within them. Today, we pray particularly for the people of the Campbellton area. May they move forward with courage, patience and love. May they manage to limit the spread of the virus in their midst and recover their health quickly. We pray for business owners as they learn to function with new rules. May they find ways to remain safe and healthy. May we as customers and clients respect the needs of others as well as our own. We pray for farmers making decisions about how to move ahead with planting. May they find the workers they need to carry on, providing food and caring for the land. We pray for parents and children, still feeling their way into this new normal. Give them patience and joy. May their fears be eased. We continue to pray for healthcare workers and first responders, for all essential workers who put themselves in harm's way. We pray for our political leaders guide their decisions, comfort their souls, and restore their strength. We pray for our congregations, our families, our neighbors, our communities, all those who are impatient to be back to normal, and especially those whose health concerns make re-entry more difficult. We pray for those among us who are feeling their vulnerability and facing their own mortality. May they know they are held in the hand of the Holy, May they find the companionship and comfort in spirit. May they remember that they are never alone. In all things for which we pray, give us grace and wisdom for the sake of Jesus the Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the joy of spirit be with us every day. 
May we notice the gifts of music and laughter, of love and compassion, of connection with our loved ones. What an abundance of gifts we share. If you would like to contribute financial gifts to support our con congregations, you may do so by sending a check or by contributing online through Canada Helps. The information is available at the end of this video. Thank you for sharing in the ministry of Prince William Pastoral Charge. May the light of Christ bless you and keep you in hope. Thank you for joining us. Amen.